David Evans is from our sponsors, Mazas. Last year, David spoke about the green shoots of economic recovery. And so this year, he is building on that theme by talking about how we can help develop those green shoots of recovery through innovation. David is perfectly suited to talk about this as he has many years experience as a corporate finance specialist and business advisor and has acted as lead and advisory partner to many rapidly growing entrepreneurial businesses. David has been UK senior partner for nine years at Mazars and chairs the UK executive. He is also senior advisor to the group executive board, as well as an experienced corporate finance practitioner to SMEs and mid-market companies. I am delighted that he has, that he's here today to present this address. Thank you, David. Welcome. So, morning everyone. That wasn't bad, but you can do better. Who was up too late last night? <laughs> morning everyone. Morning. It's funny when you join a conference part way through and you don't know too many of the people. It feels like you're always playing catch up to try and understand what's been going on. And one of the first things I heard this morning was that the police were called in the middle of the night to a disturbance. That wasn't one of you, was it? <laughs> And I was travelling up in the lift this morning with a group of people. If I looked around, I might even see them. And one of the ladies was explaining to her friends that the room she was shown into very late last night um, had already got someone sleeping in the bed. <laughs> <laughs> and then they got out of the lift, so I never heard the end of the story. <laughs> Some people in this room will know how that story ends. And if you look around for a blushing face, you can go and ask them afterwards. Anyway, it's really good for me to be here. Uh, I'd really enjoyed coming to, uh, to, to share an hour or so with you last year. And um, as Mike said, the theme this year uh, kind of builds on what we were talking about last year. And it's something that I think is so relevant to what we do day by day in the workplace. It's something I get very excited about. Now, there's um, one or two sort of housekeeping points I'd like to make first. Being senior partner of Mazar has at least one thing in common I've learned with being president of the United States. And that is when you cease to be president of the United States, they still call you Mr. President. Now, I ceased to be senior partner of Mazar at the end of last year. But it's interesting how many people still call me senior partner Mazar. And I uh, looked on your website at, yesterday, actually, at the agenda for today, and I saw I still had the title. Well, um, I left, I, I stood down from all my Mazar responsibilities at the end of last year. That was always the plan. I've done the job for nine years. And one of the things leaders have to do is know when to go, in my view. And I faffed around a little bit, trying to work out what I wanted to do. And I'd just like to tell you what I am doing, because it's so relevant to what we're talking about today. I set up my own consultancy business, it's just me, about a month ago. And I'm starting to advise um, lots of businesses, mainly entrepreneurial businesses, around these themes. It's, it's around strategy, it's around how you uh, shape your business in the 21st century for the emerging world uh, that we're moving into. And um, I'm working with one or two small account smaller, much smaller actually, accountancy firms in Mazar, just in an advisory capacity, and I've been appointed to the board of one or two companies so far to try and help them um, with the development of their strategy. And so what I'm doing day by day is very close to what we're talking about this morning. And obviously, uh, after today, if you feel the stuff I could help you with in your business uh, or your clients in their businesses, obviously, I'd be delighted to talk to you. If you um, Google innovation, you get lots and lots and lots of different... Um, definitions, and I've just put up a few that rather appealed to me. 
I don't want to go through them. I mean, you can read the words and you get the idea. But the, the, the last two, I think, are the ones that are the most significant. Innovation is about creating value in our businesses and in the wider economy. Innovation is about driving growth in our businesses and in the wider economy. And it sits for me somewhere between invention, which is starting again, and just improvement, which is tinkering, tweaking. It's kind of somewhere in the middle. One thing I did do was Google, um, when I was preparing for, for this morning, Google innovation in accountancy. And what it gave me was that little bar that says, no matches. So <laughs> I thought that tells a story. And I'm not very good at preparing my own slides. I get someone to help me. And I asked the person who was doing my slides, all I wanted for this slide was just the, the screen you get on your computer when you Google something and it gives you no matches. But when you work with these creative lovies, that's far too complicated for them. So I think they've gone probably a little bit over the top with that slide. All I really wanted to do was say, Google can give you almost any piece of information. But the idea of linking innovation and accountancy was news even to Google. But for us, we're running businesses. We're advising our clients on how they run their businesses. We're active in a, a, a vibrant, dynamic, ever-changing marketplace. And it seems to me that for all of us this morning, this is our challenge, to unlock the innovation potential in our businesses to drive transformational growth. But that's just skirting across the surface. We have to dig deeper. And before we start to dig deeper, I'd like to spend just a few minutes showing you a video that sets the scene. So, one of the slides on the um, video says, we live in exponential times. And it concludes by saying, so what does it all mean? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry if that's a disappointment. But one thing I do know it means is that if we carry on running our businesses over the next three years or over the next five years, as we have been running them over the last three years or the last five years, we probably won't have businesses in five years' time. The times are changing exponentially, dramatically. Personally, I find it really exciting. I find the marketplace that we're operating in, the challenges, the demands, the opportunities, the threats, I find them so exciting. I think we're enormously privileged to be operating in a business community in these very challenging times. But the challenge to us is that we adjust our way of doing business to reflect the exponential times that we're living in. Now, we have to dig a bit deeper, I said on my last slide. And these are the hooks that I'd like to hang my thoughts on about innovation. We're looking at the big picture. What drives the need for innovation? And what sort of shape does innovation take? And I want, these are just the hooks that I want to hang my thoughts on. I want to talk to you, first of all, about four megatrends that are impacting the global economy, that are shaping the local economies that we operate within. I'd like to look at what I call three faces of innovation and see the different shapes that it takes. <coughs> and I'd like to stand back and look at it in a slightly different way. So, the four megatrends. The first one is globalisation. If you look up the definition of globalisation, it talks about the processes that promote worldwide exchanges of national and cultural resources, or, expressed a little bit more simplistically, the processes by which businesses operate on a truly international model. 
Now, of course, that includes international trade, but it goes further than international trade. If we just focus on international trade, I was reading in preparing for this morning that that has increased by about a hundredfold over the last 20 years. So just look, standing back and looking at those 20 years, who can remember the Berlin Wall coming down? Who can remember? Do you know what year it was? 1989, just over 20 years ago. When the Berlin Wall came down, the number of people, the, the, the participants in the global economy, if you define that as the parts of the world that um, were involved in a capitalistic style economy was around 600 million. North America, Western Europe, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, parts of Asia Pac probably. 20 and a bit years later, the number of participants in the global economy defined in the same way is around 5 billion people. The main increase is through the BRIC countries adding 3.3 billion, plus a number of other countries, uh, Middle East, Africa, other parts of South America, other parts of Asia Pac. There's a staggering increase. And it completely transforms the way in which people think and the way in which people do business. Globalization is advancing at an incredible pace. And if we were able to look back from, say, 20 years or 30 years into the future, my feeling is, my sense is, that our perspective on globalisation is that it's just starting. If we could see it as a football match, I don't think we've even reached the first half of the first half. We live in exponential times, and exponentially, this game is moving on. And it has a huge impact on the market, on competition, on manufacturing opportunities, on labour availability. We've seen industrial globalisation transforming manufacturing models, say the Toyota model, retail, say the uh, Walmart model. We see uh, knowledge globalisation starting to take root, all aided by the increased, increasing ease of international travel, mobility, uh, the internet and so on. And businesses are increasingly, as a consequence, not recognising geographical and political boundaries. I was in New York on business when they introduced the iPad 2. Was that two years ago? I can't remember now. And I had a few spare hours and I was going, uh, I just did a bit of sightseeing. And I was on one of those double-decker bus tours. You know, I love doing double-decker bus tours in cities I don't know. And I think the tour guides on the New York tour buses are the best public speakers in the world. I've been on this tour several times over the years, and I think they're the best public speakers in the world. And we were going past an Apple shop, and the tour guide, there was a big queue outside because people were queuing up for their uh, iPad 2. And um, the tour guide was lamenting the fact that large corporations, to use his words, have more allegiance to their stockholders than they do to the unemployed people in their countries. Whatever your political perspective on that might be, that is the reality. Countries are operating above and beyond the geographical and political constraints, and that's the market that we're operating within. So this poses enormous new threats that we've never experienced before. It poses also enormous opportunities. China is a dynamic environment, a dynamic economy that is completely transforming the shape of cons the consumer goods that get produced right across the world, and particularly in the Western world. Take, for example, the car industry. Most of the new, probably all, of the new luxury cars that are being announced in 2013 are shaped significantly by the Chinese market. The new Range Rover that was introduced a few months ago is longer, several inches longer than its predecessor, because if you're nouveau riche in China, you pay someone to turn the steering wheel and you sit in the back. And so they have to extend the car 
to appeal to the Chinese market. The new Mercedes S-Class being introduced any minute now has three different lengths for a similar reason. Maserati are talking about a four times growth in their sales over the next, I can't remember the number of years, I read it a few, few months ago, uh, very few years, and in a single word, the reason for that is China. The world that we're operating in is changing. There are huge opportunities for us, all of us, however big, however small the organisations that we work in. There are huge opportunities and threats that we've never had to experience before. And if we're not responding now, then uh, in three or five years' time, the businesses that we're running or the businesses that we're advising will be very different or maybe won't exist at all. The second mega trend is virtualization. Now, globalization is frequently talked about. Frankly, virtualization is much less talked about. And I'm sure virtualization is fueled significantly by the global recession of the early 21st century. And what's happening around us is the virtualization of business organizations across multiple dimensions, including technology, including people, including business models. And the overall effect of this is decoupling the tightly coupled physical environments that have been prominent, supply chains, a tightly knit office environment where everybody comes to the same place to work every day. That's being decoupled. It's collapsing under its own, frankly, financial weight and sluggishness to a more virtualized model. Why? Well, it's partly cost, because the old model, the closely coupled model, is being proved to be less efficient, more expensive. And the information revolution that's emerging from <coughs> social networks, telepresence, mobility, is enabling new levels of collaboration, which so greatly appeals to what uh, I would call Generation X or Generation Y becoming significantly the, uh, the, the dominant force in the businesses that we're running. So the previously deep engagement that people needed, which they could only get by the coupled, the closely coupled communities of working in one place and looking people in the eye and talking to them, is being replaced by a less closely coupled, a decoupled uh, environment. And this impacts the technology that we use, the human work experience, the processes and the organisations that we work in. My eldest son works in Accenture and in, in central London. And it would be wrong to say he's not allowed to go to work in the office every day. It would be wrong to say that. That would be too strong a statement. But he's actively encouraged to work at home two or three days a week. Why would you want to hack into London and suffer the indignity of commuting to work in an environment that gives you, in their view, and this is a, a pretty high-tech company, it's a very well-run company, I think, at the centre, in their view, uh, no advantages over the collaboration that you can achieve through the virtual technologies that are available to them. Those of us who are over, say, 35 uh, find this much more difficult. Those of us that are under, those of you, <laughs> sorry, those of you that are under 35 probably find it much easier to relate to this. But you see the flatter structure of this decoupling in the practical ways that you do business now. So if you go online to buy something, you may be heard about the product on a social networking site. You may be see a video showing what the product is like that's made by a company probably unrelated to the company that's selling it. You go on onto the website of the company selling it, someone else takes, another company takes the payment, another company organises a distribution, probably the, the courier van that turns up at your door is another company, five or six or seven companies, much more horizontally integrated, seamlessly working together. But the old structures, the vertically organised hierarchical structures that have uh, categorised most sizes of company 
for decades are being replaced um, by a loose, less closely coupled and less formal structure. This is virtualization. And the third megatrend is what I call the millennial generation. Not using the term in the biblical sense, but effectively, Generation X and Generation Y. Roughly speaking, people aged 15 to 35. They are the first generation of digital natives. Technology is sometimes defined as what was invented after you were 12 years of age. Well, these guys, up to about 35, have probably grown up with a computer in the house. They've probably grown up with the internet available to them. Increasingly, they've grown up using um, social networking sites. And it's shaped the way that they think. And it's shaped the way that they respond. The lens through which they view business, the lens through which they view life, their approach to problem solving is just different to the older generations called baby boomers. I hate that expression, but I can't think of a better one right now. Just take the educational experience of, say, a baby boomer. When we were at university or studying for exams, it was a very lonely existence. You'd go and study in the library. You'd research. You'd write it all out longhand. It was, it was isolated. It was probably time inefficient. But that shaped the way that we think. It shaped our approach to problem solving. The millennial generation has a completely different view. The first thing they'll do to, to, to solve a problem or to find the answer to something is to probably talk to their friends on Facebook. They can research online. The amount of information that you can get online is staggering. They probably never need to leave their room. It's a virtual experience. They'll talk to their friends, they'll share it. It's much more efficient. It's much more collaborative. It's much less isolating. And this shapes the way that the millennial generation think. Now, the baby boomers tend to look down on the millennials. They don't work hard enough. I've heard that so many times. They have a different perspective on life. Well, they do have a different perspective on life. I'm very uncomfortable with the, well, they don't work hard enough. I think they do. Uh, they just work in a different way. And they have a different value set. Um, the value set is uh, things like the uh, balance of their work within their life is probably more important to them than it was to their parents. Things like the values of the organisation that they work in. Things like uh, corporate social responsibility. Uh, the ability of a business to give back to its community because they recognise that they're privileged people. All of these things are really important to the millennial generation. And for us who are running businesses, let's be clear, the millennials are fast becoming, maybe have already come, become, the dominant group of people in our business. And the dominant group of people in our customer base. If they're not there already, they very quickly will be. And unless you are preparing your business for the next gen, unless you're making your business next gen compatible, frankly, the next gen isn't going to work there. So three of the four megatrends. And this is each one in its own way. They're all interconnected. They're all interconnected. But each one is shaping the way in which the communities that we do business in um, is, is developing. I'm hardly going to mention the fourth one, because I have to be honest, I feel a little bit hypocritical talking about it. Um, this is not my strong point. <laughs> this really is not. I have four children who are Generation X and Generation Y, and I told them I was coming here this morning to talk about stuff like cloud technology, and they, <laughs> they laughed at me. They said, you, you have, you, that would be incredibly hypocritical of you, so I won't. But you get the drift, don't you? Technology is advancing so quickly. How many of you have a, an iPad or a tablet? How many of you have a smartphone? The great majority of the room, but just a few years ago, 
neither of those products were available. The whole basis of technology is advancing uh, to enable people like the millennial generation, to enable the virtualized workplaces, to enable the development of globalization. So how do we respond to that? Well, those are the trends, the mega trends, that affect the global marketplaces that we operate in, that shape what we do. And the innovation that businesses find, in my experience, falls into three main categories. So let me talk about each one very briefly. There are, first of all, empowering innovations. Uh, an empowering innovation transforms a complicated, costly product that previously was only available to a small group of people because it was so expensive, and makes it much cheaper and available, therefore, to many more people. And the Model T Ford is a good example. Cars for the masses. And empowering innovations create jobs, and they require capital. That's the first sort of innovation. The second sort of innovation I would call sustaining innovations, and frankly, this is where most innovation takes place. Sustaining innovations aren't transforming marketplaces. They're updating them by taking old products and replacing them with new products that are better products, or at least more relevant to the current market needs. So take the Toyota Prius hybrid as an example. It recognises the increasing need for um, uh, cars to respond to the, uh, the, the, the climate change and the, uh, the, 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 the green demands of the, uh, the world in which we're living. But it's not creating lots more vehicles to be sold. Uh, for every Toyota Prius that is sold, there's a Toyota Camry or whatever that isn't being sold. This isn't creating jobs. It's not requiring capital. Well, it requires R&D to develop the product, obviously. But um, this is just taking yesterday's product and updating it to what this year's product needs to look like. And this is where most innovations take place. What's really important, if you're running a business, is that if you are not sustaining your uh, product range at the leading edge, other people, bluntly, will be eating your lunch. Because if you make Vauxhall Vectras, or Caval what do they call now, Vectras? And, um, and, and, and you don't have a, uh, a sufficiently green offering, the people who want to buy that sort of car won't buy it from you, they'll buy it from somebody else. So sustaining innovation is the second sort. And the third type of innovation are efficiency innovations. Uh, efficiency innovations don't change the product. They just get to it a lot more quickly, a lot more efficiently, a lot more cheaply. It reduces the cost of manufacture and distribution of ex existing products. Probably one of the best examples, staying with the car theme, is Toyota's just-in-time manufacturing model. This tends to release capital and to release jobs. And we could, I'm not going to just for the sake of time, but we could go through different industries and see how the life cycle of, of a particular industry, take computers for example, we could trace through how from the very early days of the mainframe, how the empowering innovations of the PC, the sustaining innovations of developing and updating the product, and then the efficiency innovations of finding uh, dramatically uh, cheaper ways of manufacturing it, outsourcing it, uh, generally to the cheap side of the world, um, how they've transformed the way in which we see computers, the cost of computers, and how they're being made. There is another view. The, if you just go back, the majority of innovation is the sustaining innovation. And it's the pressure of profit and loss accounts, and indeed the teaching of business schools that causes all businesses, your businesses too, and your clients' businesses, I presume, to be continually seeking the higher margin 
products. So the pressure of the profit and loss account, the pressure of the budgeting cycle, is forever pushing products upstream, up market, seeking niches, seeking more profit. And that's where the bulk of most companies' uh, innovative thinking is going. But that leaves all companies and the markets as a whole very vulnerable to these disruptive innovations. Because while everybody's concentrating on pushing upstream and improving their profit margins, at the lower end of the market, where frankly it's a bit more murky, and where people are not making very much profit, there's a few new entrants. And some of them are very wacky, and they've got some really left field ideas. But just occasionally, just occasionally, they find something that is utterly transformational. And that changes the shape of the market. And all the sustaining innovations that people are concentrating on, spending their money on, suddenly in that marketplace become valueless because somebody has found a much cheaper, much better way of solving that particular problem. So this is the, the shape, I think, of innovation. We have the four megatrends, globalization, virtualization, the changing, um, the changing attitudes of the millennial generation and the advance of technology. This is shaping the market that we're in. And businesses are innovating in those three or maybe four ways. But what are we, what are we going to do about it? Well, Some things are easy. We innovate or we stagnate. I don't think it's an option, personally, I don't think it's an option to carry on running our businesses in the future as the businesses have been run in the past. The world that we're in shapes the way we deal, or it should do. And if we don't respond, then I believe we're increasingly become irrelevant. So we innovate or we stagnate. But you know, for most of the businesses that are represented here, I don't think this is quite as complicated as people make it out to be. I think it's more for us about a state of awareness. I don't think we have to suddenly go out and appoint a chief innovation officer. I don't think we need necessarily to set aside a huge amount of budget to reflect our innovative thinking. I think what it requires is an open mind and a state of awareness for us. I do think it can be hyped to a level that frankly doesn't drive innovation, it just makes it too complicated. And as I say, I don't think we need huge budgets to do this. We can do it from a pretty frugal standpoint. Breakthrough innovations are few and far between. Innovation doesn't need to cost a lot. You don't need a PhD to have a good idea. What you do need to do, and this doesn't cost anything at all, in time or in money, what you do need to do is to have a, a, an, an, an inquiring and open mind that tries to understand the marketplace around you and the extent to which that marketplace is changing. Now, I said um, I'm working with a number of, since I left Mazar, and I've only left them one month ago, just one month ago. Uh, and I'm sorry, I'm still doing quite a lot of things with Mazar, uh, quite a number of things. But I'm talking to a number of businesses about their strategy and how that is developing. And we always get into this sort of area. It's fascinating for me, having struggled with a lot of this stuff uh, in Mazar for nine years, uh, ten years. Uh, it's fascinating for me to see that the same issues, the same problems, the same challenges exist in much smaller accountancy firms, in uh, other types of professional services firms, in manufacturing businesses, in distribution businesses, 
in retail business. The, the, the issues are very, very similar. And I've got some questions that I, I love to sit down and ask people. And to me, these are the sort of questions we need to be asking of ourselves, of our colleagues, of our businesses, of our clients' businesses, to help us with our innovation thinking. And some of them are market questions. The basic questions, really. Why do customers buy from you? What's your USP? What will be different about your market in three years' time? Why will your customers buy from you in three years' time? How does the opportunity and threat of globalisation impact your supply chain, your customer base, and your internal resources? Are you continually reassessing and renewing your differentiators? Are you changing with, or better still, leading change within your market? Are you seeking niche responses to the fracturing of mass markets? Are you recognising that access to is more significant than ownership of, in terms of assets, actually in terms of people probably, and skills and resources? Are you recognising the increasingly ubiquitous competition. It's amazing. Competition doesn't come from where you think it's going to come from. In our house, I don't want to give you too much detail here, but in our house we had a bit of a plumbing crisis one Sunday afternoon a couple of years ago. And you think when you have a plumbing crisis, the people you ring are the plumbers. <laughs> I didn't. I rang the bank. And the bank sent a chap and he sorted it out in no time at all. If you want to insure your car, you might go to the supermarket. If you want to borrow money, you might do it in Sainsbury's or in Tesla. The, the competition has changed and is, is, is itself changing exponentially. These are the sort of market questions that I believe we should be approaching our clients, our businesses, our colleagues with. I was at a meeting, uh, chairing a board meeting of a new, new client to me. Uh, earlier this week, and we spent a whole day with the board. This is the first meeting I've chaired there. And uh, they just appointed me a non-executive director about two weeks ago. And these are statistics. They, they are in distribution. And my challenge to them was, but you're not changing the way you run your business to reflect the changes in the marketplace. Two-thirds of all retail transactions are done online. The newspapers said in January, indeed in December, online retail sales soared in December, while the high street struggles. If you're in distribution, if you're selling B2B or B2C, and these guys do both, they're still only farming the traditional channels. They're just um, doing what they did five years ago or ten years ago. And of course, they're under more and more pressure. Their margins are under pressure. Their sales volumes are under pressure because they're not adjusting to the changing marketplace. So that's one group of questions. The other group of questions, I think, are around people. Are you preparing a next-gen business? Because if you're not preparing a next-gen business, the next-gen won't stay there. Do you understand the different paradigm of the millennial generation, the challenges of internal organisation and models and cultures, their way of framing problems, the lenses through which they view the world are different to yours, bluntly, if you're over about 35. They prioritise CSR, they prioritise work-life balance in a different way. They are much more accustomed to engaging through social networks. And that forms part of the way in which they think about the engagement that's necessary to run a business. And as I said, that leads to some of the decoupling that we see in the businesses around us. Are you recognising the increasing significance of remote working and virtual teams, the breakdown of command and control culture? You have a command and control culture. If everybody comes to the same office every day, because um, you can get them to come at, sorry, come at 9 o'clock and go home at 5.30, you could look up occasionally and make sure they're working. If they're, not, if they're working remotely, if they're in a different place, it's, it's a very different form of management. 
these are the sort of questions that I think we need to be asking of our, of our colleagues, of our clients, and of ourselves. And this has a number of implications for us as leaders of businesses. The strategies that we're developing need to be reassessed in the context of the different paradigm of the future. The problem is we tend to view our strategy going forward through the lens of the past. The past is less and less relevant as a guide. We need to take regular timeouts with our colleagues, with uh, our, our competitors maybe, to, to try and understand what is happening in the marketplace. And we need to tap into different sources of data insight. But the basics remain. We're changing the way in which we're, we're part of a market that's changing. We need to change the way that we adapt within that. But the, the basics of deep strategies, of razor-sharp focus, of leading-edge delivery, those are just the same. Businesses in the past and businesses in the future need all of those. But there is a different perspective that I think we have to have in our minds. We have to be very clear about the difference in our strategy between core and context. And it struck me last night, I was sitting in a quiet corner of this hotel, reflecting on what I might talk to you about, how I might express some of these things to you today. And I was doing some stuff on my iPad. And I don't know if any of you have got an iPad on your table. If, you've, if, you've got, if you haven't, you've got an iPad with you, or next time you pick it up, turn it over, and on the back, you find five words designed by Apple in California. And I thought there is a company that really understands the difference between core and context. Core is your USP. Core is your reason for being there. Core is what you do better than anybody else. Context is what the market does. Everybody does it. They make computers and they, they, they outsource that to wherever in the world they can do it efficiently and cheaply. But at their heart, at their core, Apple design <coughs> world-class products. And they're very clear that that is their USP. And they only put a very tiny amount of information on the back of their products. But they were they're so clear about what they do differently, better than other people. I'd like to just um, to draw it to a close now. I've tried to share with you some thoughts about innovation, why we have to innovate, how we approach the different marketplace. And they're just my thoughts. It's a huge subject. And in 45 or 50 minutes, there's only so far that we can go. And all I've tried to do is challenge your thinking. And, and challenge you to maybe think a little differently and to try and frame some of the questions that I think are relevant to how we approach uh, running our businesses and advising our clients to run their business. Innovation is necessary to drive growth. I'm absolutely clear, having worked in an accountancy firm for many years and having in the last few weeks seen much more clearly, or starting to see much more clearly, the the, the, the issues that pervade in all kinds of other businesses are very similar. But if we want to grow, we have to grow by recognising that the world we live in is changing and that requires our adaptation, our innovation, to find new ways, better ways, of meeting the challenges that we have. I've left a few minutes at the end. I was told when I was here a year ago, it's a shame you didn't leave any time for questions and comments at the end. So. To show I learn by my mistakes, <laughs> I've managed to finish a few minutes early. So um, I'm, I'm in your hands, really. If you've got questions, if you've got comments, if you've got reflections, we'd love to hear, hear from you. <laughs> who were the people who said last year I should have had time for questions? Um, could I... Do we need a microphone or...?
Just a sec, just a second. Hang on. The video you showed at the start, will yeah. that be available? Yes. Um, the, the video was actually produced by Sony for one of their conferences, and uh, I, I suppose that's the reason the last slide was talking about how many illegal downloads there were, because I think that... I think that was the theme of the conference that they produced it for. Now, they produced it about six or seven years ago, and they've very helpfully done some updates. Uh, it's freely available. I'm not breaching any copyrights. It's freely available on YouTube. And um, I gave... Well, obviously, the guys um, have, at the back have got the link. I'm sure we could find a way of circulating the link to all of you. So I will make sure the organisers of the conference have got the link. Or, in fact, they've got it because I sent it to Neil uh, with, with my slides at the beginning. So if we could... Uh, if, if you want it, if you talk to the conference organisers, they'll give you the link. So, yes, the video is freely available. Over here, sorry. I'm interested in the aspect that artificial intelligence is going to bring in the near future. How far away is it? What threat is it? What opportunity is it? How is it going to change the environment in which we work? A lot of us here are, are members in practice, so there are going to be innovations such as use the, the new payment methods that are available that a speaker referred to yesterday. That is going to take away an element of the role we play. In that context, I'll be interested to understand your perception and how, over a time frame, how near is it as well? Thank you. Um, I mean, I can't predict the future, obviously. My feeling is that uh, it is very close. Um, I'm not sure I'm answer answering precisely the question you've asked, but let me give let, let me answer a question close to the one you asked because it may touch on your your concern i think i spent the last nine or ten years myself running an accountancy practice and through my role on the group board of mazar i've been involved in the uh, development of mazar globally um one of the things i've discovered is uh, is that if if you're dealing you have to be very clear what the service is that you're giving it's a bit like the Apple core and context, really. What, what, what is core to you and what is context to you? And if what you're doing, if the service that you're providing is a compliance function, whatever that might be, then you've got to be absolutely leading edge in terms of efficiency. And if the service you're providing is of an advisory nature, in my experience, that works best if you disaggregate it from the compliance service. Now, these are battles that we have. Battles is far too strong a word. These are debates that we had within Mazar on many occasions. But if you roll up all the services that you give, or well, certainly this was our experience, and I talked to the leaders of a number of other accountancy firms over the last 10 years. We used to meet up formally and informally sometimes. The, the traditional aggregation of compliance and advisory services into one pot done by the same group of people doesn't work. It's, it's much less resilient to the price pressures that we see in the 21st century. And so, in my experience, if you're running a compliance function, then run it purely and simply as a compliance function. That would be my advice. And you've got to be as efficient and streamlined as anybody else in the marketplace. And in, in, in Mazar's uh, experience, for example, that was taking things uh, that, that were uh, routine processes and trying to take the routine processes from all over the country and a similar routine processes and do them in as small a number of places as possible by people who just do that. And the advisory services, you also put in one place uh, and you... Uh, get a small group of people to really focus on being absolutely leading edge at giving those advisory services. Does that make sense to you? Does that help with the question? You have to be balanced in all of this, of course. I mean, you know, we're still paid 
in, in, in professional practices we, we, to engage with our clients. I mean, they, what they want will be different from client to client. But, and, and, and for all of them, they'll need to know what the, the touch point in your business is. They'll need to know that and we'll need to respond uh, to that. But I think we have to be very focused about what is core and what is context. And if we're providing an advisory service, then let's make sure we're completely focused on that. If we're providing a compliance service, then let's, we'll, we'll price it as such and we'll run it as such. That is my experience. Anything else? Over there. It seems to me that the technological advancement in accounting that members in practice are now facing is sort of summed up by the service offered by Crunch, which you may be Summed aware. up by? Crunch, which is an online um, cloud computing accounting compliance, uh, which offers a compliance service for a limited company at around a price point of <coughs> £70 per month. So that's... Um, <coughs> and my question is... That seems to present quite a big challenge to members in practice to be profitable at that level. And um, I would say that that's the key um, uh, challenge that we face in terms of technology. I'm interested to know what your thoughts are on meeting that challenge. Wow, that is a challenge, isn't it? I think it does come back to core and context. Sorry, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to give you a very full answer to that because I'm not familiar with the precise product. But that is simply a demonstration in, in practical terms of how all this applies to our businesses, the new challenges, the new threats. I do think that we have to be very clear that we are just providing and just <coughs> pricing the services that our clients are asking us for. So if it's possible to produce compliance services at that level, um, in our response to that, we do need to be clear. Are we, are we providing a service that goes beyond what that company would get by paying that amount of money for that particular computer application? If we are, if we are, let's make sure that we're identifying the additional value, the value add. We're telling people about it and we're pricing it in a way that people will respect. And that may mean that we price it separately. You know, it, it, this, the, my answer to your question, I suspect, is an extension of what I was saying earlier. In my experience running Bazaar, the disaggregation of services seemed to me to be a critical way forward. If, so the, the purely compliance part of the service has to be done cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And I haven't experienced anything quite that cheap, but it's inevitably going to get there. Uh, so in our response, let's take out of what we're doing anything that that um, compliance function, that that cloud technology would provide. Let's make sure we're not giving it away because people won't spot it in the way that they compare prices. Let's, let's disaggregate it. And if people need it, if clients need it, then let's make sure that we're telling them that in addition to what they will get from that particular product, we're giving them something more and we're pricing it appropriately. In my experience, people still need advice, in my experience. Um, and that seems to me to be the one thing that we can offer. So, of, of course, all accountancy firms provide a compliance service. Of course they do. And that's a significant part of what they do. And that has to be, in my view, disaggregated from everything else, priced appropriately, so that people can see what they're getting. And at that, that point, the price sensitivity is very, very high. And people will look around and they'll shop around and they'll see where they can get the product the cheapest. But actually, that isn't all they need. They might think it is, but it probably isn't. And what they need, in addition, in my experience, is someone to talk to sometimes, someone to give them advice. And that's what we can give in addition. 
we need to make sure we package it properly and we need to make sure that we price it properly. That will be my view.